<laughs> to give this presentation. My interest is in uh, language and ethnography and how a broader sociological, political, and historical perspective can help us to understand the complexities of Indigenous languages in Canada and the social contexts in which Indigenous languages are learned, taught, and used. My focus for this talk is Indigenous language research and how this research can broaden our understanding of the Canadian linguistic landscape, which has been developing through processes of social and political change. I'll provide an overview of key terms in contemporary research, drawing on my own research trajectory over the past 25 years, and how the field of Indigenous language research has involved, evolved, particularly through the work of Indigenous scholars. I work in the sociology and anthropology department and see my work as falling within the field of sociolinguistics, uh, broadly speaking sociolinguistics, and I see the study of language as crossing linguistics, anthropology, sociology, education, history, policy, and politics. So I see this very broad, or very, from, taken from a very broad disciplinary um, frame. The interdisciplinary approach allows us to examine how language use and language choices intersect with relations of power and with the construction and the transgression of social boundaries and contexts, all of which involve language and forms of language use, implicated in specific cultural and social practices and systems of power. This approach also has implications for applications to language education and educational outcomes and language policy in Canada and for understanding processes of indigenous decolonization and self-determination as th seen through the reclaiming of cultural and linguistic practices and the fostering of strong, healthy communities and community leadership. Indigenous languages are central to these fields and processes. This talk will comprise an overview of some of the research into indigenous languages in Canada from a broad sociolinguistic perspective that has framed my research over, as I mentioned, 25 years. I begin with a map taken from a UNESCO website, uh, um, a map of endangered languages um, in Canada. Uh, sorry, yeah, in, these are in Canada. A uh, work that Mary Jane North began, um, and she helped produce. Uh, she, used to, she is retired now from the federal government, but she helped produce this, um, this particular map that's available um, of all the world's endangered languages. And in Canada, it lists about 88 languages. So you'll hear different numbers, you know, 50 languages, 60 languages, 53 languages. These 88 languages are, are there because it's actually, it's actually difficult to define what counts as a language when you've got different ways of speaking. So even these 88 languages, you might have more languages or separate ways of speaking in individual Inuit communities. I just want to, and I just also want to point out the you can see in BC there's a very linguistically diverse area of languages. And there's different colors of indicators on here indicating different levels of endangerment or um, you know, um, vitality. So white, the Inuit languages and those in more northern Canada are the most are the least endangered, you know, the most secure. There's a couple of black marks indicating no speakers left at all. Um, after the white, uh, you have yellow, you know and then orange and then red, so it's sort of the degrees of endangerment. I have a few points I just want to make about these map, the, the, this map. Um, the first one is that many of these languages marked in yellow and orange and even red will have some language revitalization or revitalization programs, actually in white as well, the Inuit languages as well, um, which I will talk about later. And well, it's not just Inuit languages, it's Cree and Ojibwe also that have a you know, strong number of, of speakers. But, they, they will also have some kind of language revitalization pro programs going on. Some researchers, researchers and language activists prefer the term, term vitalization to revitalization, since the former draws attention to the fact that we are talking about living languages. Revitalization can mean to imbue with new life and vitality, but it also connotes reviving something that's already dead or dying, like res <laughs> resuscitation, you know, reviving something from unconsciousness or apparent death. So I myself prefer the term vitalization, and since metaphors of death and dying languages serve to produce and reproduce colonial discourses on vanishing indigenous peoples, these metaphors, as noted by other researchers, can also produce defeatist expectations in learners. That is, they can contribute to a why bother attitude about learning a dying language. So the metaphors themselves can not be particularly helpful when they're, when they're focusing on death, dying, and 
and even um, endanger, endangerment itself. Um, they're quite negative and can serve to misrepresent the vitality and life-affirming processes of Indigenous language vitalization movements in Canada. Moving on to the second point um, that I've already discussed, the, the, the first, that not, not only are languages that, um, dynamic, evolving, transforming, and evolving both in form, linguistic structure, and in use, and in language communities and, social con and in social contexts of language use, but they're also embedded in dynamic historical, cultural, and political, and economic contexts. Language vitalization, um, or lang sorry, languages and communities persist, and new ways of speaking are intertwined with new social contexts and new forms and patterns of use. Language vitalization cannot be separated from the cultural practices of speakers and communities, nor from the evolving historical, political, and economic context. My third point with respect to communities marked on the, the map is that they involve, is that those involved in language vitalization programs define their own goals. There is no unified normative framework for vitalization activities and community practices across the map. Each language and language variety is situated in a unique historical and cultural context and political context. The whole history of resistance, schooling, and relations with colonial settler society may be, which may position language communities in different ways. And the last point is to do with why we should care about language revitalization at all. In Canada, Indigenous groups have the right to develop curricula, train speakers and teachers in community languages, and develop community-based programs Excluded from official language discourse in Canada and the funding mechanisms associated with this, a nation that rides its reputation on linguistic and cultural di diversity, um, Canada, um, you know, Indigenous can languages in Canada have a, legitimate, have a legitimate place in the linguistic landscape. So the hard work and dedication of Indigenous educators and language workers needs to be recognized and respected. This is just an overview, again, of the framework that I use um, with a couple of extra, the, the historical, political, culture, with a couple of extra points on applications and the critical ethnographic research method, which I have adopted and which seems to be the most effective in these contexts of participatory action research. Um, I'll talk a bit about that, that, that research process later if people have questions about it, but it's basically one where Working with communities, communities define the goals of the research project. Um, the research itself affects social change for the group. So it actually is an implicated kind of research, an engaged research process. That is not just described, it, it, shape, it provides understanding, but it also has um, actual effect or change for the people one's working with. I'm going to, as I mentioned in the, in the introduction, um, use a overview of some key terms that have come up in the research that I've worked with um, for my own research and, and from other Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars in this area. I brought together these terms and concepts that have developed over years and includes work from an increasing number of Indigenous scholars and many of whom are participating, some of whom are participating in a panel that I've organized this for this March in Toronto for the American Association for Applied Linguistics. I was asked to organize an invited panel on Indigenous languages and identities. So the interesting thing in doing that is seeing just how much research is going on, what key things are um, important to researchers now in applied linguistics across North America mostly, and, um, and just what, you know, yeah, what those particular um, concer concerns of the researchers are and how we have so many more Indigenous researchers involved in language education research and, and Indigenous language research than even 20 years ago when I um, started working in this area. Um, I'll just continue. I'll start sort of with the first one of the first points, um, which is language endangerment, language revitalization, and vitalization. Um, Language endangerment is a powerful discourse about languages, usually referred to as smaller, smaller indigenous languages. Small languages is a term that's used quite often, um, referring to languages that don't share the, the same amount of power as English or French or other colonial languages that currently have purchase in national and global networks of trade and communication. 
There are small languages with respect to, therefore, a number of speakers, but also, more importantly, with, um, within the, in, the, in relation to the institutional and commercial power of other languages. These small languages are often conceptualized as threatened, as I've talked about before with endangerment, similar to a threatened species. And I just want to just talk a bit more about this notion, or that, that metaphor of equating language with a species. Um, that the, the idea that they're threatened through human invasive activity, land dispossession, and cultural and economic ideologies and practices that accompany this. So if, for example, if we look at a place like southern Saskatchewan, where you might have its species endangered, like swift foxes, sage grouse, burrowing owls. I only know these because I'm from Saskatchewan, but you know, there's a bun whole bunch of endangered species, beautiful species, actually, that are endangered due to the invasive oil and glass ex gas exploration, farming, ranching, urban development. So we, we have a sense of you know, that species of an animals and their habitats being um, destroyed. So do we have invasive resource extraction, environmental pollution, and cultural political encroachment on indigenous traditional land-based economies. So the this, this same kind of encroachment on, on habitats, and the habitats are where you know, species live, but also where languages can thrive. But for me, the metaphor of loss of habitat and loss of species ends there for languages. Since languages take on new vitality through new use in new ways of speaking, and in new lexical, morphological, and phonological forms. The speakers themselves are not diminishing, but increasing with new forms of fluency and speakerhood. And this itself leads to a range of research questions and space for further investigation into the vitalization of languages or revitalization of languages, and an increased focus on those doing the work. The teachers, the educators, the council members, concerned parents, children, grandparents, those in short who are involved in language endangerment um, and revitalization immersion programs, um, adult education, university or college programs, early childhood daycare or Head Start language programs. All of these have increased in force. We, have, we even have now a certificate in language revitalization program at University of Victoria, which has a number of um, students enrolled every year. There are also increased number of community initiatives running um, master apprentice learning programs where a master, usually an older speaker, is paired with a learner, usually a younger speaker, um, and they, they learn one-on-one -on -one through doing something, through some kind of activities where so the language is learned in context, a specific cultural context. Um, there's actually an excellent DVD out on um, it's produced by the Education Department at the Pre-University of Prince Edward Island on language revitalization in Nunavut in the east, in the, in the most western part of Nunavut, in Kudluktuk, formerly Copper Mine, where an Inuit Naktun is spoken. It's a, it's a variety of an Inuit language that's considered very you know, endangered, quite endangered. Of not, people aren't speaking it much, but it's a, it's a DVD that shows uh, the work of a language activist there and an educator who actually went to UVic and learned about the Master Apprentice program and brought it back to her community in Kaluktuk and is working and, and working on all sorts of other kinds of community initiatives. Um, so that's just one example, but they're you know they're they're, they're all all over these kinds of examples. Um, there's also um, researchers. <laughs> involved in uh, action, as I mentioned before, these action research projects, which are um, facilitating language learning and construction of identities, teaching, and positive social change through language projects defined by community, community members and involving speakers of all ages as well. So we can, in fact, view language vitalization as a meshing of the culture of resistance to the hegemonic forms of English or French or other colonial languages with the resistance of culture, um, where indigenous communities themselves assume, are assuming control of the institutions, policies, and the means to address cultural hegemony and social, social conditions they have faced. Another key term that comes up in language research a lot in sociolinguistics are language ideologies. So I just wanted to talk about this a bit with respect to indigenous language research. Um, 
You can have an ideology such as a language not being practical or outdated, or uh, ideologies of vanishing language and vanishing peoples that I've already mentioned, which have accompanied processes of colonial dispossession and ind of indigenous lands and habitats for land-based economies. Language ideologies can be t defined as these taken for granted assumptions about the status of language, its forms and use that become naturalized through social beliefs and contribute to social inequality. They're linked to identity and power relations and to particular social beliefs that can shape speakers' ideas about their language abilities, how well they speak language, and, and even their, shape their ideas about how much they want to learn the language and their amount of buy-in that they will have into learning those languages. The notion of ideologies can, can bring an understanding of the way in which those languages are connected to the land. In other words, local ideologies and beliefs about appropriate uses and ways to teach and reasons for learning and speaking a language. And I say appropriate ways to teach. It might be teaching the language by doing something in context, in a particular cultural context, not necessarily in a traditional classroom with a board and um, with very decontextualized language teaching methods. Language ideologies structure the social context in which languages are used and shape the choices people make about what language to speak and write. And they support language um, vitalization through linking indigenous land use and occupancy. Sometimes those, those studies, actually, that might be used, say, in a land claims case, to actually using it to document the language and elders' language about how language was used. And, and thereby, linguistics is combined with the connections of uh, struggles to land it, itself, you know, through, through the, those, those political processes. That is connecting language to place and to living well on indigenous lands, territories, and spaces. Another term that comes up is um, a notion more, the, the idea of language resources. And ever since the late 20th century, you know, we've, we've been looking now at, at language um, used in schools not as a problem, but as resources. So that the different languages that are brought into schools are seen as, as resources. And there are resources also for identity, for communication, for education, learning. Um, linguistic, there are linguistic, cultural, and intercultural resources that are all part of language learning. And um, resources also in the sense that they can have, the language itself can have an economic value or be exchanged in an, in an economic fashion through actually ha using, having particular um, abilities in a language. I think you have a teacher who can get a job teaching, a translator, someone working on a dictionary um, or creating other kinds of texts or um, getting particular jobs that where ability in the spoken language is important for the legitimacy of holding that position. Increasingly, where language with language laws and those like such, such as those or legislation such as those recently passed, passed in Nunavut, they have an official languages act now and the Inuit Language Protection Act. Language are language is potentially now more valued in public and private spheres um, than before, that kind of state-sponsored support. So that can also have offshoot effects of valuing indigenous languages as resources in local and global economies, such as tourism and marketing, or just increased use of the language in, in marketing, say, niche products or um, more kind of cottage industry type activities where the language is, is, is part of um, integrated into local economies more. And lastly, uh, the, uh, resources can be seen as mobile. This has to do with the study of language and globalization, where we have increased movement of people and flows and goods across, you know, across contexts. That includes, you know, these marketable maybe re resources and niche products where language can be attached to them. We also get new forms of, of language being used. And I'm thinking here also in the context of urbanization as more and more indigenous people move to cities and bring with them their language skills and start language programs in urban contexts or maintain connections back to their communities as well, um, using and speaking the language. Another key term linked to these, the language and resources is language and political economy, which is a field of language that embeds the study of language into broader perspective of um, of you know dynamic historical processes of resource again I've mentioned resource extraction or um, whether uh, also you know looking at linking the language to traditional land-based or hunter-gatherer economies 
Um, it can also be, in the case of indigenous languages, looking at language in the fur trade, where you might have more examples of mixing and blurring of languages through, through trade and, and colonial contracts, so looking at it historically. Um, but more recently also with the rise of multinational exploitation of oil, gas, timber, and mining reserves all across indigenous territories in Canada, we have other kinds of processes happening where through impact and benefit agreements, um, Inuit, are, are, Inuit, other, Inuit and other indigenous groups are negotiating a certain amount of employment spaces in those industries. And then the question comes in about language use or abilities to get those jobs and to what extent indigenous language will be in, in, integrated into those kinds of employment opportunities. Um, if language is connected to the land and land-based practices, which indigenous, which, which indigenous lang language researchers take for granted, then language has implications in the access of economic resources, land claims, local control over institutions and economic development, and resisting forms of development that have little local benefit. So this is much to be gained. We have much to be gained theoretically through the adoption of this perspective that language is not peripheral to central issues of that language is not peripheral and it's rather it's central to issues of land and political economic transformations. So that's the uh, language and political economy. There's also the research uh, notion that comes up a lot of, uh, regarding language identities and authenticity or who who has the right to speak a language and what's considered authentic forms of the language. And this comes up a lot in particularly if you go back to those urban contexts of language use and language teaching, those kind of questions arise a lot in the research um, about who has claims to speakerhood, we might say, or that is who has the right to speak and how these shape ideologies and practices of language use. Language ideologies, as noted above, are deep-seated beliefs and attitudes that underpin social institutions. These include ideologies about who has the legitimate right to teach or learn a language or to speak it. So all these kinds of questions come up in um, the revitalization of these kinds of activities with um, small indigenous languages and endangered languages and as they move particularly across context. Another point, um, research area that's quite a large one in, in sociolinguistics is notions of linguistic landscape. And, and just I, I, I link with this connections to, to cultural memory and language in place. It actually comprises cultural and collective knowledge and cultural memory, including place names and artifacts. And it includes communities, regions, urban and non-urban centers, and the relationship between these places. Place shapes the choices about made about speech and writing. So it's just the importance of, of of place in um, understanding the sociolinguistics of language use. Linguistic landscapes refer to the perceived language varieties in use and on display, such as we might find on signage or inside and outside of institutions, businesses, maps, and anywhere in the public sphere, including the internet. These texts are not only important symbolically, but represent continued political engagement to create a public face and a public space for smaller languages. They reflect and reproduce the presence of minority and indigenous language speakers in a different, given area. They also offer forms of resistance to dominant language forms. And I don't have examples here, but you can imagine examples just by looking at the way the map has changed in Canada. I mean, Flaubert Bay is now a Kaluit Salish Sea, or you've got Haida Gwaii instead of Queen Charlotte Island. So these say there's sort of changes sort of slowly happening. But there's also a lot happening in the linguistic landscape with respect to signage in communities, um, and um, as I mentioned before, a presence on the internet, the presence in the public sphere, in the political sphere, when presenting um, um, speech, um, you know, giving some kind of discourse in the media, etc. So um, the use, yeah, the use of dominant place names while ignoring local indigenous naming speaks to the asymmetrical power relations that indigenous languages are working against. And I, I also wanted to point out the renewed attention to indigenous language and culture is evident in celebrations. This is all part of you know, linguistic landscape. Celebrations, music, heritage, centers, churches, ceremonies, contemporary art, language appearing on billboard signs, maps, newspapers, building fronts, 
And I also note, even in public exhibitions, such as the, the recent exhibition, or the, the exhibition that's currently at, um, displayed or exhibited at the Royal British Columbia Museum in Victoria, where the exhibit, Our Living Languages, First People's Voices in BC is now running, mounted through a partnership with the First People's Cultural Council. So it's the first time within a museum, I think, that they've actually had an exhibit about languages, indigenous languages. And um, it's really interesting to see. These acts all indicate renewed interest in indigenous languages. And although such measures do not lead to language survival per se, they do represent an ambitious facet of indigenous language planning and increased opportunities for increasing language teaching and learning. Much of this is behind the scenes, but alive and well in, in office and conference rooms, community centers and schools, universities, adult cent uh, education centers, et cetera. And um, these all, all these kinds of language programs that are in the works. Another big um, area <laughs> that touches on indigenous languages is the controversy surrounding standardization. And I say controversies because remember the map of 88 varieties, and I mentioned there's probably more indigenous language or 88 languages and probably more varieties or dialects than those languages. It becomes crucial when institutionalizing a language to set some kind of standard, and then how do you choose the standard? So it tends to produce tensions between codified and institutionalized language and everyday language spoken in communities. And I just want to give one example here of um, standardization, again, taking an example from Nunavut, where um, Gila Palacloutier um, researched this for her MA at the University of Prince Edward Island and is currently working on standardizing an Inuit writing system with Inuit Tafari Kanatami here in Ottawa. Um, I just wanted to say, well, but despite the linguistic diversity of Inuit languages, what people don't really realize is that there's actually five different writing systems currently in use for Inuit languages in the Arctic. So what they are, their first step is to try to standardize an orthographic system. And the way to do it is through consultations with communities you know, to, sort of, to come up with a, a system that, that, that could be agreed upon. So you can see that the, the challenges faced in doing this, given the geographic distance of the Arctic, so I don't have a map of the Arctic, but you can ima imagine it, and the number of different communities, and, and the need for consultation to actually, rather than to, to implement this completely you know, top, top down, all of the writing systems are based on at least five systems. Some are syllabic and some are Roman orthography. So you also have the question of script, not, and not only the, the different representations for the sound. And there's four land claim regions for Inuit. So you've got um, Inuvialuit in the furthest east, um, Nunavut, Nunavik, and Nunatiavut, formerly Labrador. And so they use each of those uses one or more of these five systems in their schools, in the churches, or other institutional contexts. So um, it's been a, there's been a renewed debate about the importance of standardization in education, government, and business. And as Paulette Cloutier notes, for the survival of the Inuit language, they feel that it's an issue in protecting the language by actually surviving it, uh, by, but a protection of the language by actually standardizing it. So, yet from a research perspective, this raises a question of what does standardization mean for Inuit languages? And how will it be accepted and implemented? And to what extent should this Inuit-driven process be conceptualized as a top-down or a bottom-up process or a combination of these? And just to elaborate on this, to some extent it's a bottom-up process that is coming from the people, since it's initiated by the users of the indigenous language themselves. That's the Inuit. Inuit. And it's, it's initiated by, by Inuit and organizations like ITK. Yet standardization inevitably involves some form of top-down decision-making process by those affiliated with governance structures coordinating, coordinating the, its implementation. So when indigenous languages are brought into schools and the grammars, lexicon, and orthographies are standardized and unified, there's a marked tension between what is Western and what is indigenous. And this tension is found in both the ideologies and practices that drive standardization processes. So what we can take away from this is that it's necessary to see indigenous languages as operating in both traditional and modern spheres, and it's not an either-or situation. Language policy is another huge area of research <laughs> that um, is really, really quite broad. And I just want to talk a bit about 
how we normally conceptualize language policy. In, so in Canada, that would be official language policy. It's dominated our linguistic landscape. From, and for, regarding Indigenous languages, you know, they have a history of those, uh, the, the damaging you know, assimilationist policies, obviously, of residential schools and in the Indian Act. But there's all, there are also powerful Indigenous submissions on Indigenous languages um, to the Bilingual and Bicultural Commission. Well, they wouldn't have termed them that in the early 60s. But from 1963 onward, there, there were submissions about you know, where, where Indigenous languages fit into our bilingual framework in Canada. And um, it was decided you know, that they wouldn't be part of, of that particular commission, which resulted in an official bilingualism act, but that it would, they would, those languages would be dealt with in some other way, along with multiculturalism and other languages in Canada. Well, what, what proceeded from that was a failed effort then to, um, well, some, some kind of resistance actually documents from the Indigenous groups themselves. I'm thinking here of the 1970, 1972 document, uh, policy document, Indian Control of Indian Education from the um, National Indian Brotherhood submitted to the Minister of Northern and Northern Affairs and Northern Development. And that actually, that document in 1972 called for the instruction in indigenous languages and a, and, a, and a transition into English or French. Only after the child, this is a quote from the document on page 15, only after the child has a strong grasp of his own language. So in other words, there was already notions in the, in the 60s of the need to teach in indigenous languages and to treat English and French as second languages, which is still um, ongoing struggles in school. In schools, that, that they the children have a foundation in their in their in their in their own languages. After that report, you know, there are, there's a failed attempt in 1987 to form a Canadian Heritage Language Institute. Um, that was largely due to lack of consultation. There was a heritage language um, policy that came through that uh, Indigenous groups were, didn't feel they were really consulted or part of that. And then you have the RCAP, which came, which has lots of um, points in it as well about language and language education. But it wasn't until 2005 that we get another policy document coming from uh, the indigenous, an indigenous task force. I was um, submitted to the Minister of Canadian Heritage. That's the task force in Aboriginal languages and cultures. That was after a two-year consultation process looking at um, the state of languages. And that's actually an interesting document. So the policies are out there. Are, or official reports and, and calling for the need, but it's a question of action and a question of um, the, f the financing of um, giving proper funding to all those initiatives that are happening across, if you think back on that map, to the, all those languages that are involved in some kind of revitalization process. As researchers, however, we take language policy to mean much more than just these official acts or, and texts that are produced reports. It's also the undeclared, unofficial interactions and the discourses that regulate language statuses, uses, and choices that are transacted in, in everyday social practice. Alana Shoshomi notes that language policy can exist at all levels of the de decision making about languages, as small as individuals or families who make decisions about what languages you know, to use at the home or in, you know, with your kids or in public spaces as well as larger entities such as schools. So schools can, will implement their own language policies. And these decision-making policies represent de facto, de facto language policies. So it's a huge area of looking at language policy and how uh, uh, just studying language policy with respect to indigenous languages. Um, another key area of research is to do, of course, with new media and how language Travels across contexts and through time and space much rap more rapidly than you know with old technologies. But the use of doing media and multiple and of multiple scaled communicative resources across contexts transgress construction notions of local and global, or the urban and the rural, and the modern traditional. And the reason I I mention this is because. From research that I've worked with with Inuit in the city, is there there are connections that make the Inuit will make with their Arctic people in the Arctic and maintain those connections. And is life that much different in the city as in these Arctic settlements where you have same similar kinds of urban um, problems or and and urban situations and access to technologies and 
um, the, and, and the language is at that much different when you're maintaining those kinds of connections, even if you're not physically moving, traveling because of the long distances and the cost of travel for Inuit to go back to the Arctic, unlike other indigenous peoples and groups that you know, can easily go back and forth to their home communities in the city. So those kind, there's kind of, there comes a kind of breakdown or a meshing of those kind of dichotomies. And we see that it's much more kind of nuanced and mixed kind of notions of place, but also of, you know, like I say, modern, traditional, or you know, how you might conceptualize cultural practices. Um, and you know, mainly from all this also kind of, kind of work that's been done online regarding languages. There's a lot done on, for online learning, but also dictionary development. There's the East, Key project, East Cree project that's been spearheaded by Mary Adele Juncker at my un university at Carleton for developing uh, dictionaries online, but there's many, many other projects similar to that going on. Which leads me to a final area uh, or point, key point that comes up in the research is about the whole notion of urbanization. And it's, so it's the last of my key terms I'm talking about, but right now we know, I don't know if you know this, but it's pretty, it's pretty common knowledge that more than half of indigenous, indigenous peoples now live in cities. <laughs> Um, and it's actually a global phenomenon. There's increasing urbanization across the globe. And we, we talk about it in terms geographically of push factors pushing people at unemployment or lack of housing or, you know, and pull factors wanting better schooling, access to better health care, um, you know, and, and a better life in the city, just like all kinds of other forms of transnational migration. People, you know, move just to, to find a better or safer life or, um, better access to services. In the city, um, there are forms of language use that cut across time and space and can break down taint, these tainted, taken for granted. Oh, no, sorry, that's a, I'm, I've got my, sorry about that. There are more, um, I just want to say, if, if speakers moving to the cities have access to new technologies mentioned above, that, that what I talked about previously about breaking down those dichotomies whole, you know, that they, that they can actually maintain those connections, and people do do that. Um, there's, a, there's this also, I mentioned, that movement back and forth between urban and non-urban centers. And um, all sorts of questions from the research point of view about what it means to revitalize the language in the city, or when you've got people speaking those different language varieties, what kind of languages do you choose in those kind of programs or those kind of schools. But it's turned out for my work in, in Ottawa that that it doesn't really matter what language it is as long as it is an Inuit language. And that um, there's also a lot of shared language learning when people come together and exchanging different ways of speaking, different um, ways of defining something, talking about something, vocabulary items, and, and, and such. Um, and currently, yeah, so... Um, um, I've looked, so we've looked at then the construction of oral text, stories, and language learning through action research projects, which I just want to now um, spend a little uh, bit of time just briefly going over some of the examples. I do have some examples of this of, from um, projects on language, ways, ways in which in the city that these connections are made across um, time and space and that bring people together speaking different varieties and with different kinds of life histories. So this is a project that developed, I called, we called it the Antique Modern Roadshow. I didn't come up with that name, yeah. I was from, I'll tell you a bit, I'm just going to tell you a story now. I'm just going to, just because this is kind of interest, in, interesting and in, uh, I, this is a be beautiful project that we had. I just want to say, first of all, I had a collaboration, a long-term collaboration with the, Ontario, uh, with the Ottawa Inuit Children's Centre, which is in Vanier. And, which now has a daycare program. Um, I mean, they've done a lot. They've grown a lot. They started with a Head Start program, and they, then they've got a daycare program. They actually have a kindergarten program. And we worked with a literacy program at that time that was just a fledgling literacy program. And as part of the research project, <coughs> it, was, it involved finding out what people wanted to do. Like what we came up with, a, we, had a, we had a women's literacy group. After a focus group, we, we came up with three people to work with from different regions of the Arctic, from Labrador, Nunavut, and, um, and uh, northern Baff Baffin Island, and then another part of Nunavut. And actually around, yeah, around Yellowknife area. But 
one of the things that, that came out of that group was having holding, having some kinds of activities that would involve people getting together. And so this idea came from them of, of bringing an object to talk about well, stories became the center of what people wanted to talk about. And then it's how do you how do you you know just share stories and it's stories around objects that people would bring. So we have three of these different events, at least three, maybe even four, where people would bring meaningful objects with them and just talk about them and share them. So you have to imagine this, so you've got people sitting around a table speaking many different languages, a varieties of, an, of, of what they call now Inuktuk, um, it's the word for Inuit languages that they're using officially in, in Nunavut, I-N-U-K-T, Inuktuk, T-U-T, Inuktuk, but different ways of speaking uh, Inuit, in, Inuktuk. And there's a lot of language sharing, there's some mixing of, 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 of English, but here's uh, someone I've worked with since I moved to Ottawa in 2003. It's Sarah, Sarah Komiak, who grew up in Moose, grew up in Chisassabi in northern Quebec, and uh, grew up speaking. Has relatives in Great Well River, where I did a lot of my re my research in the early 90s. So she grew up speaking Cree and English, the Cree and sorry, and Inuktitut, and moved to Moose Factory. She had tuberculosis and was in the hospital there, and that it was there that she learned how to write in syllabics and. Um, their family intermarried, Cree and Inuit intermarried, and in 1958, believe it or not that early, she moved down with her sister to Ottawa. So she's been in Ottawa that long, and she is still now alive and well in them, um, living up in uh, past uh, Wakefield in Quebec. And she brought with her these, uh, a, a lot of different artifacts, and this is just one pictured here of beadwork that was given to her from Moose Factory. Um, and kind of designs that aren't typically Inuit types of, of, of designs. But I think more importantly, in the, in the context of this whole activity, she also brought a, a vest that had different kinds of embroidery on it, different images of Cree and Inuit on it, and different I, I, items of clothing and photographs. But I think from this, it was just also sharing the fact that you can be Inuk and grow up speaking Cree, and, um, and then uh, learning a bunch of, she learned a lot of different Inuit languages by being the interpreter on the C.D. Howe, this boat that went across the Arctic in the early 60s as a tuberculosis medical lab to um, go to different communities to find people who were sick and bring them back down into hospitals. So she, in fact, was interpreter having to learn different ways of speaking and looked at it as well. So we would say she's probably multilingual. But another example from a different, this uh, a same event, well, someone brought different um, ulus or, or women's <laughs> knives the Inuit use, and they're interesting. They're passed down from generation to generation. So, in this case, uh, Sue brought her collection of five, five generations of ulus, and it and generated a lot and a lot of discussion and talk in different languages. I actually have written about this. We've written about this in a paper. We've transcribed the interactions, but there's a lot of language learning going on about vocabulary, about what was used traditionally to sharpen knives, where people found the metal to make the, <laughs> to make the knives, and you know, it could be found from scrap boats or you know, things, and, and how they were sharpened and how they were, um, you know, which, pe which ones people thought were the nicest ones, evaluating the quality of the knives. Um, there's all sorts of information and teaching and learning that goes on in, in, the, in these interactions. But more than that, it's just, they were, you can't see from a still photo, but they're incredibly lively and, and rich. And it turned out to be the best, as I said, we must have done it about three times, and it turned out to be you know, the best um, activity, activities I think we ever did at that center. And people said that was the most um, engaging. And I think it's because we theorize about this. It's about learning language or, or, or using language in in the presence of objects that carry meanings themselves, and they're objects that connect people back to where they're from. And so the objects themselves are mobile, the people are mobile, the language is mobile, the, la the objects and the objects, through the discussion, the meanings and uh, of those objects are become part of the whole interaction, and it becomes incredibly rich and rewarding in, in language learning. Um, another project we did, of my years with the OICC, Ottawa Inuit Children's Center, where we did a couple of photo voice projects. And these were also really rich endeavors because through workshops, you know, you train people how, about how to take photographs. You give the cameras, and we gave cameras to kids and to adults. 
and we'd take pictures and bring them back the next, the next week for another workshop where we'd choose a photograph. And they'd write about those photographs. Um, and then the photograph was that the title, they'd give a title to the photograph, it would be translated. <coughs> you know, and then they were actually, they are actually kind, they were, we, we saw these as literacy activities, even though, you know, we're dealing visually, these are what we would call multimodal literacy activities, to, to visually taking a photo, you're writing, you're sharing the stories orally, sharing the stories before the text is actually written. And here's an example of even one of one fellow creating a letter M to sort of straw. There'd be spontaneous, unscripted, kind of just take a camera and do what you want to do. And taking that photograph and, and just writing his little story about this. I like the letter M and I'm going to make a cloud of things that start with M. And it's very quite, so they have very poetic kinds of things that they wrote about. And an amazing range of images. And the ones that you know were kind of chosen we produced and framed and circulated all over Ottawa. I just put Cafe Ottawa, but in fact, we went to you know different cafes in Ottawa. I think at least two, at least three different ones. A restaurant used to be the Aboriginal Sweetgrass Bistro in the market. We we exhibited there. Three different cafes. The residents for health, the health residents were in. You had come down. We re, we um, exhibited in a in a federal government office foyer um, at a university conference. And this was one, been at, even at the University of Ottawa, at the Faculty of Medicine, we, we, we mounted our photo voice exhibit. And everywhere that, that exhibit went, it, was, it went, moved into spaces where Inuit normally weren't part of that space. So, but it brought a presence of um, urban Inuit lives into different areas of Ottawa. And, we're doing something similar project with our group, with the project, a similar kind of project in Montreal, with the final um, photo voice exhibit to be mounted with the McCord Museum. So in Montreal, the idea of that kind of research then too is action research, where the desire, what 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 to produce or how one was going to represent myself comes from you know the participants, and there's a project that works to collaborate, to provide spaces to exhibit those voices or to share those kinds of um, stories and images of representation that otherwise just wouldn't be out there. So, and the language comes in this case through the translation, through the right, the literacy activities and the translation. And that's about, those are my, those are two examples I'll give. There's other things that we've, we've done, but those ones um, I think were, some of the most interesting and or successful, I might say. In conclusion, I just say that um, I have a, quite a few notes that I didn't really talk about, but in, I'll just quickly give a conclusion. We can have some time for questions. And in this talk, I, I've shared understandings of indigenous languages with respect to teaching, learning, revitalization, usage, and reasons behind why there is such an interest and why these languages should be supported in interdisciplinary endeavor. Um, language work and language research advances theories of indigenous decolonization, cultural revitalization, and language use in old and new contexts and across contexts. And so I've given you kind of a sociolinguistic snapshot of that, of the kind of research that's gone on, the ideas that come from the, the research in indigenous languages. We've also seen how grassroots activism can transform individual lives, communities, and society. And so there are many Remarkable. There are many, many remarkable individuals that I've also tried to highlight in, in my work that are committed to sustaining indigenous language and cultural heritage, and remarkable like actions of people and time devoted to language work with little pay or often underpaid. So I'd conclude just with a, a need to, re you know, expressing the need that we have to recognize and value uh, indigenous languages and, fi and financially support this work which is often unnoticed, but which has continued with, with, with continued research um, might be brought more to light. That's it. Thanks. Thanks all the people. <laughs> okay, so for questions, if you want to ask a question, you need to push the... Uh, I will. And this mic, you need to push the red button push so it turns green and you can ask questions.
you want me to elaborate on anything? Or... Yeah. I have a question. Um, the map that you showed at the very beginning, yeah. uh, I found it quite interesting. It seems that uh, those groups that are less threatened. Oh, yeah, here we go, yeah. yeah. Those groups that are less threatened are more isolated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And like there seems to be a direct relationship between how, 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 how endangered they are and, uh, and how close they are to cities, probably, or right? close to, anyway, uh, French and mostly English speakers. Um, what are the implications of that for, for, for language makers? Does that mean that we should um, isolate? Uh, <laughs> with, with the consequences that that has in terms of integration in, in the city yeah. and in society? That, that's a really good question because it raises a lot of interesting things to, to think about because we, we, they are isolated, but they also were um, often on lands that weren't wanted by develop resource developers, right? An encroachment of that kind of um, industry, and, um, which often, a settlement often accompanies with settlement um, other things, you know, including um, factors that can, you know, just, just a presence of more indigenous, non-indigenous people in the area, maybe intermarriage, et cetera. More lang more English or French spoken. So that's one thing is that, um, and the other, the other thing that, that the important raises is that these days everything's connected more and more because of the new technologies. The point I made about you know that access, if there is access to internet or television or media, it's actually not as isolated as one would think. And that's part part of my point about the non-urban and the urban is not as even separate as one might think in those in those in those indigenous contexts because. A lot of those communities in the Arctic are very urbanized in the sense of they have a lot of the same kind of urban problems, housing problems, our shortages, um, you know, well also, you know, other kinds of, you know, kinds of things you might associate with urbanization, unemployment and, and employment too. But there's uh, the and, and access to those those new technologies, television, media, of course, but also just ways of communicating and producing, you know, YouTube videos or other means of you know, um, cultural expression, being connected culturally through the internet with southern urban centers. So a lot of those, we go, the, the kids you might meet don't look that much different than you'd find in some, you know, classic American city. <laughs> so I think, or southern city, I think, um, yeah, so I, I don't know that there, that that's really the, the, the issue, but you know, but historically because there, there had been, you know, less in, encroachment of non-Indigenous peoples in those communities. And because of the historic circumstances of what happened for, regarding language politics in Canada, you know, I'm, think, I'm thinking of the rise of Quebec nationalism and language acts and the Indigenous communities then mobilizing in the 60s, 70s, around the same time, Realize that when you know education was introduced and and media etc., there was more of a chance to mobilize for resources to protect language because just when historically those communities um, that the political movement movements meshed with the social and the economic movements affecting their languages. I don't know if you understand. You know you know, you know what I mean. Like it's like if they when when they actually got those, those more isolated communities were all. Uh, had the onslaught of television and radio and schooling, you had movements, if we take the example of in the Inuit, you have the movements of creating IBC Inuit Broadcasting Corporation, where the programming was made in Inuit, and there's some really good documentaries on that if you research that. They, they now have less ending Inuit programming than they used to, because then they also had uh, CBC North, which had programming in Indigenous languages, but this, that there's a media example, and you had radio where every community got their own FM radio station and produced their own radio in their language. And then you had, similar to, you know, with the CBC, you had Inuit and Iqaluit, like giving news broadcasts in, in Inuktitut, so that you even had official radio um, having Inuktitut being used. So you had television, you had radio. Um, school system, a lot of people don't know this, but if you, there's an old, an older paper that I wrote in the um, journal of Canadian Journal of Native Studies on the on the history of bilingual education in 
in northern, in northern uh, Quebec. And the Inuit were demanding education in their language as early as 1963, pretty early. And I think I just heard yesterday, I was at a talk at Queen's University in Kingston, and the Mo Mohawk immersion has been going on in Kahnawake since 1969. These are really quite early programs of immersion for indigenous languages that people aren't really aware of. In Quebec, you know, they, the demand was for an educational education in 63. It then takes time because you think about it, you have to train teachers. You don't have people to teach. You know, that's the whole, one of the whole issues around in these indigenous, you know, vitalization type programs is when you want to institutionalize the language and say we want some institutional support, you actually need to build the capacity through the teacher training, which all costs money, but it also requires time and requires partnerships with universities to give credentials. So McGill with, with Arctic Quebec, McGill University partnered with our Arctic Quebec to train teachers. Before that, um, other other universities in Quebec also partnered and they gave teacher training. Um, but in northern Quebec, I just know that from interviewing teachers about this um, in the 70s, they had teacher training um, in, a, in a place called La Macasse in Quebec. The Catavic School Board, they had a land claim agreement in 1975. The Catavic School Board was or it was signed in 76, and the Catavic School Board came into being in 78, and the Cree School Board. So in 1978, running their own school board, the, the communities could institute, you know, institutionalize, you know, their language, their language education. The problem then becomes once you get that in the schools, so now you in Nunavut and in Quebec, you would have a Nunavut kindergartens degree one, two, and three, how do you have the resources to then the, build the capacity to, to teach, continue teaching grades four, five, six, and all the way through high school, and develop all the curriculum? That's part of the standardization project. These are all linked to, this is what I find really, the only way to really talk about this kind of work is how everything's sort of linked, because then if you could stand, if you had a standardized orthography, say, across the Arctic, you could share those curricular materials more and build those programs. But the, the political, and is the political will there, and is the will there for the funding, there's been, you know, legal cases that more money is needed for education to implement, actually implement the Nunavut land claim agreement, you know, and what I'm saying, that's, these are all part of those kinds of political processes as well, where language is implicated in education, and, and I just would say that, that part of those white dots are because those communities kind of came at age Politically, when they came of age of realizing that they they wanted to use their language and keep their language and institute and, and teach in their language and institutionalize their language, other languages have much more um, pros, uh, different kinds of processes of contact of, of, of colonization, colonial contact of more devastation through residential schools, maybe of the languages. That, that would mean, though, that um, even in those very close contacts. Mm -hmm. You could perhaps counteract that effect by giving uh, giving uh, people control over their own institutions. Yes, absolutely. That would be the that would be the argument. It's a key fact, and that was why the night I mentioned the 1972, you know, Indian control of edu Indian education. That's also not a new concept to control education, and and controlling education meant controlling our lang our language programs, and and thereby creating uh, indigenizing the education system, if you like, you know. At, it's not, they're not new, it's just that it takes so long to actually implement them and the resources to get them going. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <coughs> I, uh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Okay. Now, I have a question that I was thinking about, you know, the idea of modern and heritage, mm -hmm. um, which, I mean, I'm formulating my question this way. So, hopefully. Um, the, you know, because of the of the bilingual of official bilingual framework, and this is the it comes from the you know the colonial philosophy. The, the French and English are the modern ones. I mean, get modernized. There are resources to develop those languages, and you know. And uh, when I was listening to Bonnie Jane Oracle Henry Moore and stuff, uh, it struck me at some point she said she said, listen, like we get funding under heritage. Yeah. So we are a, we get fun, funding as a cultural artifact. Yeah. So talking about modern identity and I'm thinking about Maori who did re revitalize successfully. Uh, and they did put an enormous effort into 
modernized. So, yeah. so presenting the Maori language as a modern, as modern, modern yeah. as English and you know yeah. and other languages. And they did it through uh, advertisement, even in the in the news in the in uh, on the TV they have ads. You know, of Maori speaking Maori in all kinds of uh, everyday normal context, and I think that maybe the, the the northern part, the isolated part, the issue of you know, are we modern or are we heritage, uh, is less present because they are not as much in a contact with you know those. In, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, what, what, are, what are, if you see where I'm going? Yeah. This. I think I see what you're talking about. I don't. I don't know. You can correct me. <laughs> but, maybe. but but I think the issue is is that the one is, one 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 enacts traditional practices through modern means and and the being you know traditional or you, or you want to say heritage or traditional or something like practicing Inuit practices for instance does not mean um, I mean, you, what what one does that today? It's it, it's still going on. There's still lots of um, hunting and sewing activities and um, la and language around those activities. There's still land-based economies in, at play. This is not this is not a question. And there's still the adoption of new technology and com computers and modern like and modern and modern life says and no one really questions that there's there's some dichotomy there at all. It's not. It's one just is. And I think that's the the difference, um, I, you know, I, I think the food practices, like we think about food practices for Inuit, one of what Inuit that I, in these, in these, in the, in the activities I've worked with, food is really important. And if you can get, yeah, and if you can, you, but they, but they will go to great, people will go to great lengths to bring food in from the Arctic. So fresh food that's Inuit food that's caught by Inuit hunters or, <laughs> or fishers, and you've got, those kinds of and, and 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 that is is considered to be part of being a modern Inuk of being able to continue to eat these more traditional foods or engage in heritage practices, whether that's sewing or and there, and it involves in new and creative ways. And as those particular objects cross contexts, like they as they travel, you know, they they adopt they take on new kinds of meaning, meanings as well. You know, and it's a, it's a very it's a, it's not it's not the sort of either or sort of you know modern or this. It's like that. The idea of being, you know, and I think that would be a pro I, I only speak from people that I that I work with. But I think that would be across indigenous context. I don't think people see those as really that separate. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, it's like yeah. You know, well, the, the question is all about the, the policies. How much? Because what, what struck me when when one came oh. was just, just more talking about the thing. She said, okay, listen, we get funding and we we are. Uh, uh, we are helped, you know, if, it's if a, we present, if, if, if we present as a heritage, a cultural piece of, of heritage yeah. maintenance. So yeah. And what way I think is that <coughs> the, the Maori, you know, which well, is an, like a, a, an official effort to even, you know, even the corpus plan, to working on, on vocabulary, on dictionaries, on, you know, creating words for new realities. And I, I mean, I'm just out of curiosity. Can you, I mean, is it a culture, the revitalization culture in Canada, or? Uh, oh, okay, well, I've lost the track of the question, but it, okay. it, the, the, you mean I the creation of new modern, of, the, modern. The, the languages are also, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, again, I can only speak from knowing and with, the, with the Inuit languages of that there's, everything is translated into, it's not a dog, some, the odd time you might get a kelp put in or kind of a word, you know, that, that's, a, that's used, that's inserted or a boring word in a language, but often the word is actually translated into something in Nukta to put it. Like I get the, the word for city that you said, what was it? That I, 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 I said it's um, living in a big place <laughs> or something, but you know, there's a, you know, big, like the, um, the, the vocabulary, the, the concepts that might be introduced are, are in, in nuktatized into their language, a lot of them. But there's different ways of word, but the majority are, you know. Um, that's a way of bringing, and that's a way of kind of the meshing, rather than an either or, like there's a way of, and that's how the language also speaks to this point of how these languages, the white, the white languages have remained stronger, is that they've had those processes of, of turning 
I'm using the contact languages. Languages are in contact, incorporate them into their own language so that they, they are modernized. The language is modernizing along with the people. That's actually a key point. Yeah. So this kind of code that, exists. Yeah, that absolutely happens. Yeah. This, and I won't, again, I'm speaking for the, from the Inuit example, but absolutely that exists in, for the Inuit example is that the, the language modernizes along with cultural um, change, changes going on. And therefore, the language doesn't is definitely not an archaic kind of older or traditional form. But I have a feeling this happens in other languages too. But if your funding mechanism says we'll give you funding for this, you will make an application to get that kind of funding. But you know, you, it, it can be used. In, yeah, it can be used in different in, for different kinds of activities, which can serve multiple purposes. That purpose of the funding, but then also have other effects, maybe unintended consequences, effects. Did I also mean maybe the revitalization of languages is institutionalized or is it community-based? Uh, no, I think it's very much community-based. It is community, community yeah. 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 So what you didn't mean whether there is an effort no. on the global no, no, level. But is there a culture or is there, is there a, you know, this idea, okay, yeah, we want to be modern or we modernize, even not saying this, but yeah. you know, the language evolves, the traditions evolve, we integrate new traditions into our culture yeah. and I think it's especially um, obvious in the urban settings. Yeah. Well, you know. Yeah. Or, but actually in other, in other settings as well. Yeah. 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 Do you have a question? I just want to add to your uh, map. Um, how many endangered languages are actually represented here? Uh, are, are all 88 there? Because the color I understood is the level of endangerment but not different languages. So the farther north you go, the less endangered these languages so you, are, but are they the same languages or are they different languages? This, this map was modified. My, uh, my original, <laughs> I just realized I'm missing the reference here, and I don't know. The reference is from the, um, I have to look and find, UNESCO, it's the UNESCO website on the um, map of endangered languages. If you go on that website, it's an interactive map. Mm -hmm. So if you actually click on the point, you will get a little box that will tell you what that language variety is. So each of these little pinpoints represents a particular language that has been um, identified. But you know, as I said, there could be like, you know, there might be other ways of speaking that just they don't consider to be like. If I give you an example in Quebec, well, actually, like I mean, it looks like they've got one. They might not all. They might in this map they might not all be on there. There should be two Baffin ones and. And in Quebec, there should be two Quebec varieties, but they might have just given one dot for Quebec. But in fact, there's two. There's two language, would say, would say dialects of varieties in, in northern Quebec. That is, you have a one along the Hudson Bay, uh, along the north coast, the Hudson Strait coast, and another variety along the Hudson's Bay coast. There's 13 different um, village, you know, settlements. 13 different um, settlements in Nunavik. But there are two factors there: the language and yeah. the level of endangerment. Yeah, this, these so are all, that, those are all. And these are all. These all represent a particular language. But I'm even saying that some of them might not even be. The different varieties might not even be indicated here. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. So and it's not clear for me, I guess, yeah. that which language are these different are languages different that are being endangered, or is this different levels of endangerment? These are different. The same, different the same languages. languages by different levels of endangerment. No, different languages. All, different All of languages. them are different languages. Yeah. So the red doesn't necessarily so, mean that they're more endangered. Yes. No, right. yeah, that, that means that. That's what I thought, but that doesn't seem to be. So, so yes. like, but how do you represent, let's say, the same yeah. language <laughs> that is not endangered, the same language yeah. that's not endangered in North, but it's endangered in BC? That's right. How do you show that? Um, Perhaps I can help. They would, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've been working for the Department of Canadian Heritage for some time. Before that, Indian Affairs, yeah. Health Canada. Before that, with First Nations for seven years. Yeah. And Mary Jane Norris and I yeah. worked closely yeah. together. Uh, mm -hmm. She was the one who, from Canada, provided the data to inform the UNESCO map. In fact, the UNESCO doesn't have yet the resources to update it. She has since identified 90 languages, yeah. 90 Aboriginal languages that are still spoken yeah. in Canada. Each of the dots represents a separate language. language. Now, there's always been a debate between linguists as to what constitutes a language or a dialect, and that debate will continue. Yeah. Mary Jane herself has identified 
research 90 languages using, well, we could contact Larry Jane and ask her for yeah. the criteria. The different colors do indeed represent the five different levels according to UNESCO's criteria for endangered languages of language vitality, the red ones being the most endangered. And in preparing a response to the UN um, just two weeks ago, I counted each and every one of the dots, and indeed there are 88 there. Yeah, they're good. <laughs> um, there are 65 of those 88 currently either endangered, severely endangered, or critically endangered. And of the 90 that it, they're still spoken, and still is in parenthetical quotes, because yeah. uh, a good 15 to 20 of them rest in the hands of a handful of elders. And they have no replacement standing behind them. Um, as I said, 65 are, are at that state. So, yeah, they hope that helps. Yeah, so there are different languages in, in the, identified in those particular regions. Yeah. But just to say, this dot, I just, just to sort of explain. So we've got a dot here, this would be the language spoken, I guess, in this area, and a Newfoundland, a, a Labrador language, and another Quebec language. Now, yeah. what Mary Jean has done, of course, is if you look at Alberta, there's a single white dot in yeah. the northeast. It doesn't mean that that is the only place, place. in that, either Alberta or Canada that that language spoken, but that is where the highest concentration of uh, identified speakers of the language reside. But we cannot show both factors with one of those pins. Whether it's the same language which is endangered or you, the same language that is vital. You would need an awful lot more pins. In fact, Mary Jane collaborated with the production of a right. language map in 91, 2001. And the map is almost the size of that screen in its large yeah. version, and it is so dense with data, mm -hmm. it's remarkable. But this is for simplification purposes. Kind of coalescing the different um, speakers. Yeah. A representation. But it also speaks to the other, like the, li like the, the limits of representation of languages and how it is, it is, it is complicated. I mean, it, it's more complicated than it looks, how to define a language, how to represent it visually. Um, well, and yeah. 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 Okay, we have time for last yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, and this question is about when you spoke about ideology and the right to teach the language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right, as a speaker and yeah. a teacher. Yeah. And this is something that was um, has become very stark for me in recent work. I, I just started being involved in this area of research myself. Um, do you know about Mila Sarkar's work with the Big Mac Community Data Education Project in this group? Yeah. In Quebec, I'm part of that project now for about a year or so. Mm -hmm. And I've been visiting the community and looking at, um, as you say, really remarkable individuals who yeah. have been involved in developing. Uh, New language teaching methodology for Big Mac, who had started an early start program in kindergarten and adult education. Yeah. Now, the driving force behind the development of this program have been two sisters in, in their 60s who are now, one of them retired last week. Yeah. So, one yeah. of us in charge of this teaching. Yeah. And when we visited the community this past spring, we went out to dinner and we were talking about this and the um, the teacher herself and her sister who were, who were involved in the creation of this curriculum didn't see a future for any instruction after their retirement. And except I was and my research colleagues were, were um, participating in the language classroom and we saw that there were adult learners who had been studying with these two sisters for many years mm -hmm. and had reached a, a, a very, for us, by the a very high level of Mi'kmaq, yeah. and and yet the the teacher herself wasn't able to consider that that person could ever become a teacher themselves. In fact, she would constantly say, "Well, these people aren't speakers." Mm -hmm. They use the word "speaker." Yeah. They, well, they're yeah, they're learning, you know, but they're not speakers. We don't have any more speakers left. The average speakers are in their fifties. 
Yeah. So we don't have any more speakers in the classes. So they were looking around for people to teach. And as researchers, we had come in and we had said, well, there they are, right there. Yeah. And But there was this real disconnect between between yeah. their expectations of who would be able to carry the torch after them. Yeah. So I wonder if you could talk about this a little bit more from your own experience. Is well, this something that you've seen? No, but I think it's a, it's a really excellent example of exactly what I was talking about. Uh, from a, um, that I don't think that would be the only, that's not the only kind of, that's not the only case of that happening. Because, um, as I said, it came out from some of the, um, some of the work that will be presented at the panel that I organized for next March. But um, who has, I, I think it has, I think it ha it happens when there is particular yeah that this is a role of, of ideologies and they're really as a, I guess the thing way of thinking about it is that they're really naturalized this is the way it is and if you're not considered that this could be an appropriate teacher you know what what do you do so how you change ideologies like a way of these taking ground ways of speaking is through is through talking and communicating I guess it, it, exchanging ideas trying to you know. Um, Broaden people's perspective. See that there might be another way of looking at things. I, I don't. I don't know. But there, the big. Um, I know something that's come up is one of the one of the one of the key issues is actual training of teachers using community-based language classes to train to, specifically to train the teachers to go into the schools, right? And so. Um, I was just to give an example. I was just on on Vancouver Island in Hokumiun territory in around Duncan, BC, and the Hokumiun language has been used. It's been one of these languages. It would be one of the red languages there. I guess actually I don't, I don't know where Kelly is. See it on Vancouver Island, but <laughs> maybe it it should there it, it, it should be a number of different languages. There's also Saanich that has a revitalization program. But say let's say look take Hokumiun. They have um. In their ceremonies, apparently, because I, I talk to people who work, engage in language work, in ceremonies they continue continued using the language. They still engage, in, you know, they still they, they have potlatches and where their use of their language is has traditionally been passed on. So they've actually got young speakers, <laughs> like speakers, of, but it might be kind of restricted in particular contexts. But then they have a they they have language courses going on in the in the and there's a, a, a university satellite in, in Duncan, a classroom where they are teaching language. They're, they're actually constantly doing kind of language teaching and upgrading to language for language teachers going on, you know. And it's a big concern. I guess I just say that is that this idea of, of keeping the tr teachers trained and, and, and continual kind of language work with, with the teachers is really important. And maybe also using resources of people in the community who still fluently fluently speak the language, you know, is to do that. And if the if there are the same kind of um, ideolo ideological problems of who can who can is a, is a legitimate teacher, you know, from a cultural perspective, it makes it a whole lot easier to be able to do that. If there is that that kind of issue, I think there has to be a way of looking at the pragmatics, you know, the just bringing in a kind of pragmatic perspective, um, you know, to see because not ending well. Yeah, exactly. And I. And, and so it has to, but it has to be resolved at the community level. That's just it. It has to sort of come from. They have to sort of realize they have to. They have to sort this out because they're going to be in a crisis of how they're going to train their teachers for these language programs. Perhaps they were. I, maybe I'll. I'll get in contact with you later. But in the for for these particular people that were hoping to in this, yeah. if there were uh, examples from other communities that. I think so. That's the other issue. I mean, I, was, I mentioned people from beginners to intermediate, and yeah. have them still be seen as viable teachers. Because I think that this kind of sharing of those strategies, like as I said, the Inuit Nakhon language teacher and looked at, adopted a master apprentice program, learned on Vancouver Island. You know, BC they've got more master type apprentice programs and things, but actually brought it back and. It's interesting to see our language nests or something else has been adopted through the Maori and, uh, and, uh, and Hawaii, Hawaii research. And these kinds of things are often shared. And, if they're, and maybe that's also the part of the picture of just, you know, the, the increase what's, what's changed now as from 20 years ago. It's a lot of more of increased sharing of these resources and, and strategies. And uh, the will in communities to 
to do something and then to participate. But that would be something maybe to think about as some kind of you know ways that they could be connected. Though from one side of that country to the other, but there's a lot happening in music. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Well, thanks a lot.